Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Lord's Day service from Port Rush Baptist Church. And again, thank you so much for taking the time just to be with us this morning as we meet around the Word of God. You'll remember the gospel meeting at 6.30 this evening. Again, it'll be on our YouTube channel and that you can tune into that. And you'll remember also our Bible study at 7.30 on Wednesday evening. And uh, again, tune into that if you can. But let's just fill our hearts this morning and, and let's just come before together. Our Heavenly Father, we bow in thy presence this Lord's Day morning with the hush of creation surrounding us. And Father, we just dwell before thee to thank thee and to praise thee in the Savior's name for thy care and for thy provision towards us, even over this past week. We can again must declare to thee, our Father, that you are good, that thou alone, our Father God, holds our breath and our times in thy hands, and we would have them there. Father, we are content to rest all that we are in thy arms this morning. We thank thee, our Father God, that thou was promised not to leave nor forsake us, to meet us at the point of our need, and, and Father, to promise that all of our need would be met in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, for so many who are watching in this morning, we thank you for our soul's salvation. We thank thee, our Father, in a world that's so full of turmoil and unrest. We thank thee for the peace of God that passeth all understanding. We thank you, Father, for that hush within our soul that tells us all is well. And as we come into thy presence this morning, our Father, we pray for thy blessing to rest upon us as we would meditate upon thy word. As we would continue on in our studies in the book of Acts, we just pray that thou would be with us to help us and to guide us. And Father, just be with every home today and be with every family, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you have your Bible with you this morning, we're going to Acts chapter 2. We're just looking at the first 13 verses of Acts chapter 2. Let me read them to you. Let's hear the word of God together. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when, these was, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man his own tongue wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and dwellers of Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia, Pontius and Asia, Phagra and Pamphylia, Egypt and all in the parts of Libya and Cyrene and strangers of Rome and Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians. We do all hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. And there were they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Amen. And may God bless again the public reading of his own inspired, precious, holy, infallible word. We are looking at this study in the book of Acts. We are looking at the boldness of the church. And this morning we're looking at the boldness of anointing, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now, we haven't time to go into everything that that means, but I just want to bring out one or two thoughts from our passage this morning. This last year, this last year or so has seen such a tremendous surge in YouTube and Facebook and Zoom preaching. Our computer screens, our TV screens are alive with church services from all over the world. Drive-in churches have popped up all over the place. As churches have had to look during this time of lockdown that we hope is coming to an end, we've had to look at different ways of 
bringing God's word to our fellowship and also bringing God's word out there into the world. But as someone who has lived in that world of preaching into a computer screen as, as I'm doing today for the past year, there is a fear that is beginning to creep into my heart. A fear that as pastors and preachers forced to live in this artificial environment of YouTube preaching and all the rest of it, that we lose the anointing of God in favor of self-promotion, in favor of likes and dislikes and subscribers and views and slick presentation. And that we allow the convenience of stay-at-home church going to become the accepted norm. Beloved, with all that we have seen in this past year, where is the anointing that bathed the early New Testament church? With all the online preaching, with all the driving services, with everything that has happened, what really has changed? Other than as churchgoers, we have been able to pat ourselves on the back and congratulate ourselves on how well we were able to adapt to this difficult situation. So this morning, I want to look at the boldness of anointing. Or perhaps maybe a better title would be the lack of boldness of anointing. What I'm talking about this morning is the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the anointing of the Holy Ghost upon the church of Jesus Christ. This supernatural power that can turn ordinary men and ordinary women into spiritual giants that turn the world upside down. As we look at these well-known verses this morning, and, and many of you who are saved or church goers will be very well acquainted with these verses. But I want you to see just some wee things. I want you to see, first of all, the day of anointing. The day of anointing. Verse 1 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Pentecost would have been one of the best attended celebrations of the year. Because it fell in the month of April, in and around the month of April, where the weather would have been a whole lot more favorable. And of course, the good weather, you know what it's like. The good weather brings the folk out. And if the weather's good, then the people come out. And there were great, uh, a great company of people in Jerusalem at that time because of the Passover. And, and there are great comparisons to be seen between the Old Testament Passover and the New Testament Passover. My, in the Old Testament Passover, well, that took place 50 days after the children of Israel left Egypt. But this new Passover, this day, my, it, it took place 50 days after the Lord Jesus Christ left the tomb. In the Old Testament, Pentecost celebrated the birth of the nation of Israel, Exodus chapter 19 and verse 5. But the New, Test, uh, the, the new Testament uh, Pentecost celebrated the birth of the church. Acts chapter 2, verses 41, 47. The Old Testament Pentecost witnessed the slaying of, of some 3,000 souls in Exodus chapter 32 and verse 28, while the New Testament Pentecost witnessed the saving of some 3,000 souls. The Old Testament Pentecost marked the day when the law was given to Israel at Sinai. The New Testament Pentecost brought the, the, the power and the might and the authority of the Holy Ghost in grace and power in all his fullness upon the church of Jesus Christ. Of course, those 120 believers in the upper room that morning crowded into that wee room had no idea of all of that. They were met together at the command of the Lord to stay there in Jerusalem until the Comforter would come. Now, there are three things I want you to see here about this day uh, of anointing. I want you to see here that they had to be patient. They had to be patient in prayer and supplication. They had to be patient in perseverance. They had to wait. It says, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come. Now, beloved, it was now 10 days after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Lord had told the disciples to go to Jerusalem and wait for the Holy Spirit to come. Maybe they hoped that as soon as the Lord 
had left. And as soon as they would get back to the upper room, my, the promised Holy Ghost would come. But no, they had to wait. And, and I want to tell you, if you're anything to me, you hate waiting. I hate waiting. Standing in the queue. Oh, I hate it. We live in an instant world today. Instant news. Instant gratification. Instant coffee. Instant food. Instant this. Instant that. And the, that mindset is beginning to penetrate into the church. We want God today, you see, to work at our time scale. We want God to be at our beck and call. But what does the psalmist say? And we need to remind ourselves of this in this rushing world that we live in. The psalmist says in Psalm 27 and verse 14, wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Now in Acts chapter 1 verse 14, it tells us that they spent those days uh, uh, Continuing with one accord in prayer and supplication. That's how they spent those days. They didn't sit about twiddling their thumbs. They weren't looking at their diaries. Not at all. They, they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Beloved, can I say something to you? I'm speaking to Port Rush Baptist Church here this morning. Is there an argument for us today in Port Rush Baptist Church? And we want God to move and we want God to bless and we want God to save and we want God to revive. But is there not an argument that before all of that, we need to shut ourselves away in a time of extended prayer and supplication before God? I'll leave that with you. That patient, the patient waiting upon the Almighty to meet with us at the very point of our need. Oh, we can, we can all have our opinions. And we all do. I'm a pastor. I've heard it for nearly 30 years, everybody's opinion. I, I, about all that we need to be doing in the church today. But there's very few who come and say, Pastor, we need to shut ourselves away for a week, a fortnight, and pray together. They have to be patient in prayer. Secondly, they had to be at peace with each other. They were all with one accord. Now, you let that sink into your head just for a wee minute because it's absolutely amazing. Fellowship is a miracle. I believe that. Fellowship is a miracle. It is a gift from God. And it's absolutely amazing here. Can you imagine it? Now, folks in Port Rush, can you imagine this? If all of us were to spend the next 10 days, 24 hours a day, day and night together in a wee room, what would it be like? Huh? How would we get on? I dread the thing. I dread the thing. But that's what happened here. There was a miracle of fellowship. Because if you read through the Gospels, you discover that even when the disciples were with the Lord Jesus Christ, when they walked with him and spoke to him, and when they listened to his preaching and saw everything that he did, there were so many times when the disciples were not of one accord. Now, there were those who wanted the preeminence. There were those who wanted to call fire down from heaven and destroy the Samaritans. Thomas, he, he lived with crippling doubt. Peter, he denied the Lord. There was one who became a thief, had a backslide, a stabber, and, and, and a betrayer. Well, they weren't always in one court. But now, there is a divine atmosphere of fellowship amongst the people of God. And maybe it was because they had spent the last ten days praying together. And bearing one another's burden. And seeking the Lord. But now there's no envy. It's gone. The power struggles have subsided. The doubts are dispelled. The failures of temperament have been resolved. And as they wait in the upper room. They're united and at peace. As never before. Oh what does the psalmist say in Psalm 133 and 1. Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren. To dwell together in unity. My Amos 3 and 3 says, can two walk together except to be agreed? 
Ephesians 4 and 3, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Beloved, I feel that these 10 days, that these 120 believers spent in that wee upper room were days of breaking down of self and of building up in Christ. I want to say something to the wee fellowship at Port Rush Baptist. I'm only through the door six months. I know that. And I don't know very much about you. But I've found this. And here's what I've found. And this is to the glory of God and not the glory of you. But we have something special in our wee fellowship. There is a special fellowship in the coming together of God's people in Port Rush Baptist Church. There is a sense of something divine when we meet together that I have not known for a long, long, long time. And I would say, listen, dear brothers and sisters, covet it, nurture it, protect it, work at it, pray over it every single day for it is so, so precious and so needful if we are to know the blessing of the Lord. They had to be patient in prayer. They had to be at peace with each other. But you know something else? They had to be in their place before God. They had to be in their place before God. It says they were in one place. They were, they were where the Lord had told them to be. They had found their place. Now I want to say something to you this morning. I'm going to say it bluntly. I'm going to say it straight to you this morning. That the place of the child of God is not to be sitting in front of your TV or your computer screens, in your pajamas, drinking your coffee and watching preachers preaching. That is not church. Yes, there was a time for that when there was lockdown. But those days are gone now, God willing. And that is not church. And that is not where you're supposed to be. That is not your place. Now I know there are some and because of ill health and because of age they can't get out anymore. I understand that. And that's where YouTube and the rest are great. But I fear that we have created couch potato Christians who don't want to go back to church again because they would rather sit in their pajamas pick and choose who they want to hear. And if they don't like it, well they can just rise and walk out or pick somebody else or don't even go to church at all. Don't listen to anybody. I say to you, if that's you this morning, and if that's the way you're thinking this morning, I want to say this to you. I'm going to say it to you again. You will never be part of the blessing and anointing of the Holy Spirit where you are. If that's what you're determined to do and that's what you've chosen to do, listen, be pre prepare yourself because you will not know the blessing of God. Hebrews chapter 10 and 25 says it very plainly. Not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. Listen, if you're reading the signs, you can see Jesus is coming. We need to be together. Need to be together. Oh, beloved, these believers were gathered together in oneness of heart, united in God's love and united in love for God, trusting in the promises of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they were in their place. And that is important. And beloved, that is where the anointing of the Holy Ghost is to be found. When God's people are together in prayer and they're together in fellowship and they're together in their place, there'll be blessing. Oh, the day of anointing. But secondly, I want you to see the method of anointing. Verses 2 down through to verse 4. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven. It was of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire. And it sat upon each of them and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. No doubt the believers that were meeting in the upper room. They weren't idling their day away. We've seen that already. By the they were praying, they were in supplication. Maybe they took time to sing a hymn. Maybe took time to ponder the scriptures. But they were before the Lord. And they had been told that they were going to be met with the Holy Ghost. Who would take the place of Christ with them. And who would never leave them. 
Can you imagine? Listen, it's okay for us. We, we're reading this. But, but can you imagine what it was as these believers were sitting for 10 days in that wee room waiting for God to move? Praying and weeping and supplicating the throne of God. Can you imagine the expectation? Could you imagine the nervousness? The sense of not knowing what was going to happen next. Beloved, oh that we as God's people would come on the Lord's Day morning with such intent. Oh, there's three things I want you to see once again about this anointing. First of all, it was a divine anointing. It says, and suddenly in verse 2, there came the sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sinning. Even though they had been told to wait for the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost would come, they still were taken by surprise. It says, and suddenly. These believers had been waiting for 10 days. They had been praying, and they had been seeking for God, and then suddenly God moved. It doesn't say anything different happened. On the 10th day. Doesn't say anything different happened. They were doing the same thing as they've been doing in day 1 through day 9. But on day 10 God moved suddenly. Beloved we need to be prepared. To wait. Upon the Lord. In prayer and supplication. For a period of time. And it may feel as though God is not moving and God is not hearing and God is not interested and God is not going to answer. But I want to remind you of his promise in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen: If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then suddenly, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin and heal their land. Love, when God moves, he doesn't waste any time. He doesn't hang around. My, we're waiting for the rapture of the church. <laughs> We've been waiting from Pentecost to now for the rapture of the church. We have. But when I tell you, the Bible tells us when the rapture occurs, it's going to be sudden. The twinkling of an eye. Oh, when God moves, he'll not waste time. But love, listen, if you're watching in this morning and you're not saved, God's not going to waste any time. He's not. Christ could come today and you're not saved. But here's the wonderful thing. As Christ, as quick as Christ could come and as suddenly as Christ could come today for the church, you can be saved. You can be saved. All you have to do, listen, is repent of your sin. Commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord. The Bible tells us, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And in that moment, in that twinkling of an eye, you can be saved. Oh, listen, trust the Lord Jesus Christ because, listen, God's not going to waste any time. But, beloved, this anointing of the Holy Ghost, I want you to see it didn't come through human manipulation. It wasn't something that was sung up or worked up or danced up. It was an anointing that was divine in its origin. Beloved, the danger today is that we want to try and generate blessing. We want to generate anointing. Instead of coming before God and pleading our total bankruptcy without him. Pleading that we can do nothing without him. But no, instead, give us more music. Give us the latest songs and the latest choruses. Give us slicker presentation. Give us more up-to-date preaching techniques. Give us this identity Christianity, being like the world, anything and everything. But admitting what we truly need, we need God to move. And without him, we can do nothing. Where is the suddenness? Of God moving today. Where are the sobs and the cries over our nation and over our sin? Where are they? Where is the challenge of God's word today? Where is the miracle of God descending into the midst of his people and Holy Ghost power? Where is it? Where is the turbulent rushing mighty wind of the breath of God in our meetings? Where is it? I'm asking you. Where is it? 
These believers were suddenly in the midst of a rushing mighty wind inside the building. I tell you, outside the building, life was going on as normal. People were celebrating the Passover as they had always celebrated the Passover. But life had taken a totally different new dimension inside the room. God the Holy Ghost had come as he came at creation and moved over the face of the waters. As when he breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life and he became a living soul. As he breathed over the dry bones and brought them to life. Beloved, there will never be another Pentecost. You know that and I know that. We don't need another Pentecost. But I want to tell you, we need to be living in the liberty and the power and the might and the dimension of a Pentecost. What God gave us that day, we need to be living in it today. It was divine, a divine anointing. But secondly, it was a divided anointing. Look at verse 3. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. What I mean by a divided anointing is that these tongues of fire sat upon each of them. This was an anointing that was not just for the preachers. It wasn't just for the apostles. It wasn't just for Peter, John, and Luke. It, it was for all of them. All of them. All who were there. And it's for all of us. There were people in that upper room that day. And we will never know who they are this side of heaven. Their names are not mentioned. The things that they achieved and did for the Lord Jesus Christ are not recorded for us. We'll never know them. But they were baptized by the Holy Ghost. And they were used of God. Beloved, your gift and my gift, whatever those gifts may be, they need the power of the Holy Ghost upon them. You know, when I'm preparing a sermon... Some people think that, you know, pastors just sit down and they just churn out sermons. You just press a button like on a computer and they just churn out a sermon. It's not like that. I wish it was, but it's not. When I'm preparing a sermon, I'm constantly praying over that sermon. That God, the Holy Ghost, would use it to the saving of souls, to the restoring and edifying of the church of Jesus Christ. You see, beloved, where there is Holy Ghost fire, there's power. Things change. Lives are changed. And that's what we need today. Do you see that word sat? When it says that the, the, the tongues of fire sat on them. Well, in the Greek, that, that carries a great force. For it means a completed preparation. And a certain permanence of position and condition. That's what it means. There's only one baptism of the Holy Ghost. All right. There's only one. Now you can be filled with the Holy Ghost many times. Paul talks about being continually being filled with the Holy Ghost. But there's only one baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that happened when you and I got saved. For it was then that we were baptized into the body of Christ. Into the church. And what happened in that upper room had never happened before. It will never happen again. But because of it. There is Holy Ghost power within you and me because God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, indwells you and me. And that power is released into our lives and through our lives as we yield ourselves to him. It is divine in, its, in the anointing. It was a divided anointing. But thirdly, it was a dominant anointing. It says there in verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. By dominant, I mean this, that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. Beloved, the, the gift was not in the rushing mighty wind. And the gift was not in the tongues of fire. The gift was the person of the Holy Ghost, the third person of the Trinity. And it is God, the Holy Ghost, who equips the church to obey the Great Commission. To get into all the world and preach the gospel. He is the one who equips each and every believer. To find, find their place in the work of God. And to do what God would have them do. But just let me say a wee word about tongues. Because tongues are mentioned here in verse 4. And I don't want to get into a debate about tongues. Or, but I believe that this gift of tongues. Was given to aid in the preaching of the gospel. As we can see in verse 8. And they said. And how hear we every man his own 
tongue wherein he was born. And I don't believe that the gift of tongues is in operation today. Uh, because, well, because we have the whole canon of scripture, we have everything that God has, wants to say to us. And we have the canon of scripture in many languages today. And we have training in different languages as missionaries go out into different parts of the world. And so I don't believe that the gift of tongues is needful for today. And I have never at any time in my Christian life. And many people sought to influence me and talk to me about tongues and the need for tongues. And all. I have never felt at any time in my Christian life any desire to speak in tongues. I have enough bother speaking English. And I know some will disagree with me and what I believe. And that's fine. I have no problem with that. Those are debates for another day. And we can talk about that at another time. But where I believe we can agree is this. We need the Holy Ghost power. And the anointing that he brings. We need it in the pulpit in Port Rush. And we need it in the pews in Port Rush. We do. Day of anointing. The method of anointing. Finally, I want you to see the marvel of the anointing. The marvel of the anointing in verses 5 down through to verse 13. In verse 5, it tells us this. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Jerusalem was full of religion. It was full of devout people. But I want to tell you this. And maybe you never thought about this. Many of the people who were celebrating Pentecost that day were the same people who only a few days before were crucifying the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. Religion. Listen, religion will damn your soul to hell. You need Jesus. If you think because you're a Presbyterian or a Roman Catholic or a Methodist or whatever, Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon, whatever it may be, that that's going to get you to heaven. No, it's not. Religion's not going to get you to heaven. There were religious people stood around the cross and cried, crucify him. You need Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. A personal relationship with the one who died in Calvary's cross to save you, who rose again to justify you, and who's coming again to take his people home. You need a relationship with him. But this great crowd were called together again, not, not by the cries of the mob, but by the mighty moving of the Holy Ghost, says there in verse 6. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. But love, we want people to come to church. I would just love for people coming to church on a Sunday morning, on a Sunday evening, Wednesday evening, Wednesday evening for a Bible study and prayer meeting. But they don't. And they won't. What if the Holy Ghost was moving in Port Rush Baptist Church? What if man and woman could hear the word of God speaking to their own hearts, personally to them, as it were, in their own tongue, right into their need, right into their lives, right into their situation? If there was a commotion in Port Rush Baptist Church that stirred the hearts of those who were walking by. You see, these believers didn't have to advertise the meeting. They didn't. All they had to do was let the Holy Ghost have his way. They all heard the word in their own tongue. And what was the message? The wonderful works of God that Jesus Christ came into the world and he lived that perfect life. He died on Calvary's cross. He was buried in the tomb and he rose again. And he's King of kings and Lord of glory. Oh, look at verse 12. It says, and they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? <laughs> they were all stopped in their tracks. It wasn't what they came to Jerusalem to hear that day. <laughs> they got a message they weren't expecting. Maybe you're getting a message this morning you weren't expecting. But they were stopped in their tracks and they wanted to know just what was going on. Can I say something to Port Rush Baptist Church again and to, to all 
all the churches. Who out there is interested in what's going on in our church buildings? Who is? Who's out? Who's, who cares? Who's interested in what's going on in our church buildings today? And why is that? Why is that? And again, that's something we need to ponder and think about, isn't it? Look at verse 13. It says, Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. You'll always get the light mouths who will want to mock what God is doing. And what the people of God are witnessing of. But I want to tell you, that is no concern of ours. And we will see in our next study that Peter stands up and he lifts up and he speaks up. And we're going to see in our next study the boldness of preaching. Boldness of preaching. When there's anointing, there's preaching. But beloved, the hymn writer says, Oh, for the floods on a thirsty land. Oh, for a mighty revival. Oh, for a sanctified, fearless band ready to heal its arrival. Oh, for the true anointing of the Holy Ghost upon us in these days. May God grant it to us. Amen. Let's just pray together. Father, again, we bow in thy presence, trembling, hushed before thee, our Father. For we see how far we have missed the mark. We see our Father God, the weakness of self and of our own strength and how little our Father of anything we can do. But Father, we come in all the bankruptcy, in all our weakness and frailty and failure. We ask, oh God, is it not time for God to move? Oh, Heavenly Father, will you move? Will you move in the power of the Holy Spirit? Help us to get out of the way of the Holy Ghost that he might work amongst us. Oh, Father God, we pray for our wee fellowship at Portrush. Bless the folk there. Bless the brothers and sisters there. Just keep your hand upon us. Pray for the town of Portrush. Oh, that you would save and just break through into it and use us for your glory. Father, we just look to thee and we pray your blessing upon us in the precious and lovely and worthy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you, folks. Thank you for watching in again this morning. I really do appreciate it. And look, look after yourselves and look after each other. God willing, God willing, we'll meet again. Bye for now.